Hello, and welcome to Charisms for Catholics. My name is Jill Simons, and I'm the Executive Director at Many Parts Ministries, where we equip the body of Christ by helping people learn about and discern their charisms, which is really another word for spiritual gifts. When you discern your charisms, you're able to see how the Holy Spirit is already active in your life and where He is inviting you to further build the church. Let's dive in. Welcome to today's episode of the Charisms for Catholics podcast. Today, we are going to be once again looking at saints for a specific charism. Today, we are covering the charism of intercession, which is something that we know we're all called to as Christians, and that's true and important in the Christian life. But there are some people where this is their job in the family of God in a really unique and set aside way. So I've been having more and more questions lately about what is it like for something to be a general part of the Christian life versus being a charism for some people. And I think that it's important to remember that there is a real pursuit of virtue and relationship with God that happens when we pray for other people. But some people have that elevated beyond just a really great thing to do for their relationship and to actually be their primary job or one of their primary jobs in the church. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is saints who had specifically their intercessory prayer as part of their primary role within the larger body of Christ. And so to talk with us about that today, I have Teresa Zoe Williams with me once again, who's going to be sharing about three awesome saints and a religious order that have this as their charism. So thanks for being here with me today, Teresa. Hey, Jill. Always good to be here. Love this. So let's hear about our first saint for intercession. This is like the go-to, the yes. one that so many people think of for intercession. When you think of intercession, you think of St. Monica. She was Augustine's mother and she took that job very seriously. She prayed for Augustine's conversion tirelessly for years. She never fell into despair. She never quit. She never gave up. She never was like, this clearly isn't doing anything because he's not coming around. She trusted in the process of his life and grace in his life and knew that she was doing good work, even though there wasn't an, an immediate fruit to that or an immediate conclusion to that. And I think that's so important when we're talking about intercessory prayer, because so much of interceding isn't about seeing results. It's about planting the seeds that will grow later. And that's for all of us as intercessors in the Christian life, but especially for those who have intercessory prayer as their specific charism, man, it's just, it really is about being the gardener of the seeds, the sower of the seeds and not the harvester. Sometimes like in Monica's case, you do get to see the fruits of that. She did end up seeing her son convert and then gosh, then writing all of these amazing things and teaching us in so many amazing ways about the faith. She wasn't looking to see that in her lifetime. She was looking to make sure that her son had the grace necessary to deal with life. And that's really what intercession is about making sure that each of us has the grace to deal with what we're given in life. We know, and this is a side, little bit of a side note. Do we have any writing from her? Do we have like perspective from her? Do you know um, on what this, really this was like for her? I have no idea. So that is totally a. Let me look that up really. Left field question. I'm just curious because. That's something that is so take that, that is so interesting about her, specifically the perseverance and the fact that she was continuing on. And I think that's something that can be daunting for a lot of people to persevere really in the intercession for something that seems maybe not even possible. And so I'm just curious if we have any of her like perspective on what it was like for her doing that. Augustine wrote in confessions about her. And about okay. austerity and prayer. In fact, I can read the passage, one of the passages. It's in a place of a basket filled with fruits of the earth. She, Monica, had learned to bring to the oratories of the martyrs a heart full of pure petitions and to give all that she could to the poor so that the communion of the Lord's body might be rightly celebrated in those places where, after the example of his passion, the martyrs had been sacrificed and crowned. 
We think of her as intercessing for her son and she followed him all around. He went to Rome as a wayward guy and she followed him there and she was going to make sure that she knew what was going on. And then he had gone off to Milan instead. And so she followed him there and then tracked him down. And then she was able to see him be baptized after 17 years of praying. And I think it was like just six months that they lived together peacefully in this new Christian faith together and they went to Africa and she died there. So like she literally spent her whole life praying for this son of hers. And then six months after gaining it for him, helping him gain it, she died. Her job completed. I don't see any firsthand writings of hers, but it's at a time in history where it would be surprising yeah. to have writings from a woman. So I, and I, yeah. It's like first rule of live recording is to not ask questions <laughs> you don't know the answer. But that's okay. I was curious. Yeah. Not that I know of, but many people wrote about her and like the epigraph of Ooh. her tomb survives today in the space of this oh. and things like that. So what other people wrote about her and about her experiences still survives. But I just don't see a first hand account. Yeah. That makes sense. So who is our next Actually, saint for intercession? Switch our our order up and go to Padre Pio. Because I want to okay. the one that I have listed second as like the surprise last one. So Padre Pio, he is known for his prayer. He was known to levitate during prayer. He had the stigmata, um, which really is only given to people who have spent just tireless amounts of time in prayer for others and for the good of Christ's children, um, Christ's brothers and sisters, and who really enter into the passion and the wounds of Christ in a special way. So he had a, an amazing prayer life and he, he attended daily mass ever since he was a child and decided very early on when he was about eight or 12 that he was going to dedicate his whole life to God and doing what he could for God's people. And that was prayer. I'm like the primary way we are all called to serve each other is through prayer. And mm -hmm. Padre Pio made that his life. He built his whole life about, around being able to do that. And for the time after he got the stigmata, he wasn't allowed to have any faculties because it was drawing too much attention from people and the church didn't want anyone to be scandalized. So they cut back on his availability to the public, which he was actually really grateful for because he was not at all comfortable with the fame that he had found because of the stigmata. He wanted to live that quiet life of service through intercession that he had been. And this was distracting from that. So he actually saw it as a burden to have the stigmata and these spiritual gifts as we look at them. But he also heard confessions a lot. He, he eventually was given his faculties back and encouraged to preach, even though he had never been given the faculties to do that before. After they determined that the stigmata was real, it wasn't fake. He was given back all of his faculties and encouraged to do more than he did before. So really seeing that through his life of prayer, more fruits and more was given to him. So like for the, how's the Bible verse go about the one who's given many talents, more will be given or who takes care yeah. of talents, many more will be given. And that was seen in Padre Pio's life. Like more was entrusted to him because he was so trustworthy with what he already had. Yeah, absolutely. You see so much of the, we talk about being in like the overflow, the third stage of identity. And that is clear. That's where, that's where all of these saints live a decent portion of their life. But there's a very clear example in the life of Padre Pio of there being such a wide range of functions that they're able to walk in so strongly and so competently. And like we always talk about, the lane goes from being specific tasks or specific charisms into being that moment to moment. What is it that God has for me in this next moment to be doing or in this next day or whatever kind of the, the scope is? But we see that as he is having times without faculties, times with faculties, and there's differences in what he's being asked to do, but he's so consistent in that relationship the same way we see that consistency in Christ. Yes, yes exactly. Which is a great lead into our next and final saint, but the Blessed Virgin Mary. If you don't think of St. Monica when you think of intercession, you probably think of 
Mary. If you don't think of St. Monica first, I should say. How many times in the Bible does it say she kept all these things and reflected on them in her heart? How many times do we see her in prayer, in Thanksgiving or whatever in the Bible? That was her whole life was intercession. And that's her whole role as mother of the church is intercession for each of its members. Not that she doesn't have all of the charisms because she does. She always had all of the charisms, but when we think of a very specific role in the church, her role is intercession for us as the mediatrix of all grace. So that's, she gets to dole out grace to everyone. And how can you do that if you're not interceding for them? So another very specific example would be the wedding at Cana when she interceded for the bride and groom there and on their behalf and said, hey, they need this, please give it to them. And Jesus, as we famously know, said, woman, it's not yet my time. And so she trusted him and turned to the servers and said, just do whatever he tells you. So she's leading us in intercession and in how to be disciples. And it's through her intercession that we become disciples. Uh And I just, how can you not have a soft spot for Mary as a Catholic? It's really part of our identity (laughs) and our understanding of Christ himself comes through understanding Mary as a person and as freed from that original sin and uh, as the mediatrix and co-redemptrix and all of this. It's just, and as, as there's so much of the gospels where Mary is seemingly not present, not verbally present in what's being presented, it's very, it's not any kind of jump to say, okay, if they're not talking about what she's doing, what would she be doing right now? She would be praying for all of the things that are happening and going on. And we know that she, you know, went and lived with John after the resurrection. And that the the fact that there was, I want to say that I've heard it quoted before, like another 15 years of her life. I'm not sure of the accuracy of that, but a number of years Mm -hmm. of her life after that fact, where churches are being built and planted and the church is spreading. And we don't hear about her going out and doing those things, but it wouldn't make any sense that she was not involved. And so how was she involved from, you know, John's house in the long run? It's very clearly through her prayer. And who better to commune with God and to ask on our behalf than the one who held him in her body? There's just so much to say about Mary and so much with intercession to say about Mary that we could go on for hours just on her and this. It's it's the subject of many books and, and whatnot for good reason. But if you want to know how to be an intercessor, both for a particular person and for the larger church, Mary is the go-to. She is yeah. the model of it because she does it. <laughs> she just lived it from day one from from when she was a child, of course, but from really when Gabriel came to her and said that she would carry yeah. God. Wow. She just said, okay, and, and made the whole thing a prayer. And she was able to receive that because her life up until that point had been a prayer. We don't yes. hear about her early life, but you can't receive the son of God in your physically in your body like that and grow him unless your whole life has been prayer up until that point. That's the preparation for this. That's, And that's why we're called um, to fast and to prepare ourselves before communion reception, because we need to prepare our bodies through prayer yeah. to receive God in a physical way, um, to unite yeah. spiritual and physical. It's a really big deal, mm-hmm. something unique to Catholics. And honestly, the Eucharist is what keeps me hanging on. And when I think of the Eucharist, I automatically think of Mary and her intercession and her motherhood. Yeah. She's just the perfect example, literally the perfect example of this. It's a great opportunity to say that with any of these episodes that you're listening to about the saints, and I think especially with Mary and intercession here, it is great to find and take on like a patron of a specific charism that you're using or that you're growing or in or that you've committed to or something like that to really literally have an older sibling. Yes. 
showing you how to do it better. And that's something that, again, we use our chores model all the time. It follows perfectly. You've got somebody else in the family who did this before you were born (laughs) and having them be the ones that kind of help you continue adjusting and continue growing and learning how to do it better. So if you have any any of the charisms, it's great to use these saints from these episodes to look at who can be a patron or an intercessor for me specifically growing in these different charism areas. So thanks so much for listening this week. Teresa, it's always a joy to have you with us. And we'll be back with you in two weeks talking about another new charism and saints to go with it. We're going to work through every single charism so that eventually by the time we're done, you'll have examples for whatever charisms you happen to have so that you can find those patrons and intercessors for your unique charisms. We'll be back next week with a regular episode of the podcast. And in the meantime, if you've never left left us a review, I want to encourage you to do that because those reviews and the volume of reviews actually helps us get in front of new people. Podcast apps really prioritize podcasts that have lots of reviews, good reviews to show to new people, to invite more people into this journey of discovering their charism as well. God bless you and have a great week. Thanks so much for joining us on today's episode of Charisms for Catholics. If you would like to learn more about your charisms or begin your own discernment journey, head to our website at manypartsministries.com where you can download our free PDF guide to all 24 charisms and also begin your own journey by taking our charism assessment.